All right, well, welcome to another episode of Traveling Through History. We're really glad you joined us this week. Uh, we have a great topic for you, one that um, really anyone who loves history has been thinking about for a long time when it comes to the formation of the United States and our country, which direction we were going to go in. Uh, back then, all these amazing founders that we had that helped form this country, this new experiment, a uh, democracy and a republic that had never been tried before, uh, essentially a government by the people and for the people. Um, However, as you'll find out in this program, and you may already know, um, many of the founders did not agree on what direction the country was actually going to go in. When we were talking about the Constitutional Convention, the uh, founding documents that we were going to be living under, how to form our government, if our central government was going to be strong and centralized, or if it was going to be distributed and among the people. And really that uh, debate between the Hamiltonians and the Jeffersonians Hamilton being on the side of the Federalist Party, which believed very strongly in strong federal government, government doing a little bit of everything for everybody, a strong central bank, uh, doing much more than what was enumerated actually in the Constitution itself. Those were the Federalists that believed that the United States could not become what it has become without a very strong central government, uh, in some cases to the detriment of the states. And then on the other side, you had the Jeffersonians who were anti-federalist or Democratic Republican was the name of the formal party they were part of at the time. They believed actually in a very weak central government that really took on only a small number of enumerated powers, uh, military, post office, um, secretary of state and foreign affairs, those kinds of things, but largely stayed out of everything else, stayed out of education, stayed out of all of our other um, daily life items that really should be managed at the state and local level because those governments are closer to the people. So that, that's the debate that they were having back in the 1780s and 1790s, and largely we're still having today, 250 years later. Uh, we are still struggling with and trying to dec decide which direction we want to go in. So a very interesting debate we have for you today. We're going to bring you a lot of interesting facts. We're going to uh, give you a brief summary of kind of the Hamiltonian versus Jeffersonian uh, visions for America. Uh, figure out uh, from your perspective, maybe even drop us a comment about which vision of America do you think actually won? Or do you think we found the perfect balance between the two, which is what the founders were trying to do? They were trying to strike a perfect balance between federalism and states' rights. Um, so we'll take a look at that. Then we're going to look at two short videos, and we'll come back and comment on both of those short videos. One of them is uh, a factual-based video, and the other one is a reenactment of a debate between Hamilton and Jefferson. Uh, in this debate, they're going to be talking about the central bank, but you can just imagine this reenactment we're going to watch uh, happen so many hundreds of times when these two gentlemen were in George Washington's first cabinet. Uh, and you can imagine what the heated arguments were like. Uh, and then we're going to come back at the end of the program, as always, and we're going to look at our 25 interesting facts about uh, this debate between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so the uh, what's the case for Alexander Hamilton and the Federalist vision of America, and did it win out? Um, Stephen Knott, who was a professor of national security affairs at the United States Naval College, said that we live without question in Hamilton's America. There's no question that his Federalist vision of things actually won out, and that's what we're living in today. Uh, he, had, he says that he had the foresight to see the United States emerging as an economic military power that would surpass Great Britain and all other European powers and be the greatest uh, power that we've ever seen on Earth. All of Hamilton's policies as Treasury Secretary and President Washington's closest advisor, he wanted the citizenry to think of themselves first and foremost as Americans, not as New Yorkers or Virginians or Georgians, but as truly Americans, as one people. Hamilton became the nation's first Treasury Secretary at a time when the citizens of South Carolina and New Hampshire had about as much in common with one another as did someone from Tasmania and the United States. Hamilton succeeded in creating an American sense of identity, in part by creating institutions that would bind the people together to their national government, not to their respective states, such as a national bank and the assumption of the national government of state, national debt, national military, and all the other functions of the federal government. 
So in Mr. Knott's argument, uh, he feels like Hamilton won the battle and that uh, we went much more in the Federalist direction. Uh, he believes uh, that history without Hamilton's contributions uh, would have been almost impossible for the United States to have emerged as the superpower in the 20th century. Hamilton's economic vision was contrary to that of Jefferson's, and as such, the United States might not have moved, or at least moved as quickly, in the direction of becoming the manufacturing powerhouse that it became. Hamilton was a father of American capitalism, which arguably produced one of the highest standards of living in the world, Not says. His policies at the Treasury Department were designed to enhance the development of manufacturing. His economic policies, such as national bank, tariffs to protect American manufacturing, and the stabilization of the nation's finances all enabled the country to establish good credit abroad, all contributed to the overall rise of the United States as an economic superpower. So that's his argument that uh, Hamilton and the Federalists really uh, pushed our country mostly in that direction. Obviously, there was some states' rights that were maintained, but largely uh, that he won that, that battle. Uh, in addition, the note here is that uh, you have to remember Hamilton was the driving force behind the Federalist Papers. Uh, he wrote 51 of the 85 essays total. And uh, of course, that was a huge influence in the newspapers back then in colonial America to um, get the states to ratify and accept this constitution that had just been passed by the Constitutional Convention. Uh, without the Federalist Papers, likely these states would not have taken it on. So for all those reasons, uh, that was given for why the Hamiltonian vision has won out. Uh, in terms of Thomas Jefferson's vision, the Anti-Federalists, the states' rightsers, the Democratic Republicans, uh, Kevin C. Gutzman writes in his new book that he asserts that Thomas Jefferson's influence on the American political history outstrips any of the other uh, founding fathers by far. He argues Jefferson infused the United States with a Republican spirit that has characterized the country since its inception. Jefferson is chiefly responsible for the disentanglement of government and religion. So in other words, no established religion, unlike most countries. The general consensus at the time of the revolution that the government would be Republican and most of its office holders elected and term limited. That was a real key to what Jefferson believed in, that people should not um, serve forever, but they should serve for a short time and they should go home. Uh, Gutzman says, um, Republican principles championed by Jefferson, such as local control of dem uh, democracy, local control of education, local control of land holding, decentralized government in all ways. In addition, he says, the Louisiana Purchase by Jefferson orchestrated the primary reason that America became the transcontinental country that it is today, which allowed it to eventually become the economic, military, and diplomatic superpower that it is today. Wisman also points out the principles in the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, which Jefferson wrote, widely copied other states and incorporated into the U.S. Constitution by James Madison. So it was an important document as the foundation for the Constitution. In England, you couldn't attend Oxford or Cambridge or serve in Parliament if you weren't Episcopalian. Jefferson thought that was wrong. Jefferson's view is that government can only pervert religion. The government can only impose on people's conscience, and so it should not be involved in these types of activities. Although Jefferson himself was a member of Virginia's lauded aristocracy, he spearheaded the disentanglement of the system, <clears throat> which prevented landholders from dividing properties to future generations. In colonial Virginia, 85 families owned all of the land. With the change that Jefferson brought in, instead of land distribution by uh, who you were from and what family you were from, land distribution was done even for the common man. It was really an exemplary Republican ideal that was new, that had never been thought of in any other government. Jefferson grave marker lists his founding of the University of Virginia, but not his time in the White House as one of his primary achievements. And Gusman says there's a good reason for that. People don't even realize Jefferson is the man who conjured every university these days. Prior to the founding of the University of Virginia, university curriculums were more aristocratic, according to Gutsman. The centerpiece of the curriculums were Greek and Latin. Students came to class to recite what they had memorized. Jefferson believed instead that students should study what they desired and thought useful. 
Instead of reciting what they memorized, students demonstrated their knowledge with essays and exams and debate, which weren't used anywhere else on the continental uh, United States or even in Europe at the time. So it really was revolutionary what Jefferson did to our education system. Jefferson advocated the power of state governments to such an extent that when Jefferson talked about his country, he was referring to Virginia. In general, Jefferson thought that to have a Republican society, it needed to be highly decentralized. It didn't mean, though, that he thought it wasn't necessary for the federal government to have necessary strength when it came to diplomatic and military affairs. So you can see Jefferson, it wasn't that he didn't believe in the federal government at all, but he wanted to be much more limited in scope and enumerated in the Constitution exactly what it was to do and that it was to do nothing else. Everything else should be left to the states and to the people. So this is the essential debate that we've had in this country, in our formation, in our founding, uh, and even now. Uh, there's still much debate going on about which country we, we want to be. Do we want to be more centralized, more powerful at the federal level, or do we want to limit the power of the government and um, preserve individual freedoms? That really is the debate we're talking about here. So let's go ahead and take a look at our first video, and we'll come back and talk about it on the other side. State power or federal power? That was the fundamental question that the Federalists and Anti-Federalists debated between 1787 and 1788 during the ratification of the new U.S. Constitution. Hi, I'm Mr. Ramage, and this video will give you a brief summary of the arguments made by both the Federalists and Anti-Federalists during this ratification process. The Articles of Confederation, America's first government, was on its way out and was being replaced by the new U.S. Constitution. Drafted by 55 delegates, signed and approved by 39 of them in Philadelphia during the summer of 1787. Under the Articles, the federal government was too weak and proved to be ineffective. The new Constitution created a larger, more developed, and more powerful federal government. Not everyone agreed that this was the correct path for the nation. Many of the 16 delegates that declined to sign their names to the Constitution believed that this new government would trample the state's rights and rule like another King George. In order for the Constitution to become law, it needed to be ratified by at least nine of the states. Things started out easy enough with Delaware ratifying in December 1788 and followed quickly by Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, and Connecticut. But soon a serious debate began to take place in other states, specifically Virginia, New York, and Massachusetts, which openly opposed ratification. The Anti-Federalists, as they would be known, had some serious reservations concerning the Constitution. They feared that the increase in federal power and authority would come at the cost of state power, and that the new executive was nothing more than a monarch in disguise. Anti-Federalists saw the Supreme Court as a danger to the authority of local courts, and that the much debated necessary and proper clause would grant Congress too much power and authority. They also argued that a true republic could not exist at such a large level, and that the nation was simply trading one tyrant for another. However, the biggest argument raised by the Anti-Federalists was the absence of a Bill of Rights. This issue would place the approval of the Constitution in jeopardy. The Federalists, those who supported the ratification of the Constitution, went on the offensive, writing a series of essays arguing in favor of ratification and explained the reasons why a stronger government was necessary to the nation's very survival. These 85 Federalist papers, written by Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison under the pseudonym Publius, made solid and reasonable arguments for ratification and addressed the concerns of the Anti-Federalists who in response also began publishing papers using the pseudonyms Brutus, Cato, Sentinel, and Federal Farmer. The debate raged between both sides and ratification of the Constitution appeared to be in jeopardy. A Bill of Rights was the main sticking point. Federalists argued that the Constitution did not require a Bill of Rights as it only limited government power and not the powers of the people. Anti-Federalists believed that a more powerful government would inevitably limit the rights of the people unless those rights were specifically stated. Eventually, compromise would come between the two sides, with James Madison surprisingly leading the negotiations. The state of Massachusetts would vote to ratify the Constitution on February 6, 1788, under the condition that the new Congress would consider amendments ensuring the rights of American citizens. After Massachusetts voted to ratify, 
Maryland, South Carolina, and New Hampshire followed, giving the Federalists the nine states necessary to officially ratify the Constitution. Virginia then ratified in June and New York followed in July, but North Carolina did not ratify until November 21st, 1789, and Rhode Island until May 29th, 1790. True to his word, on June 8th, 1789, James Madison himself introduced to the United States House of Representatives a proposed Bill of Rights to be added to the Constitution. Of the 12 approved by Congress, 10 of those rights would be ratified by the states and the Bill of Rights would become law. So there you have it. The compromise reached in Massachusetts gave the Federalists what they wanted, the ratification of a larger and stronger federal government, and the Anti-Federalists got a Bill of Rights, specifically listing rights, privileges, and protections for the American people. This debate was an essential event in creating our nation's government and the liberties that we value. I hope you enjoyed this summary and I encourage you to explore this topic in much more detail. Take care and I hope you learned something today. So, so many interesting points we need to discuss there about that video. Uh, the first one being, think about what was happening back in 1787 as these men were coming together from 13 different colonies with 13 different agendas, 13 different kinds of people many of whom had nothing to do with each other and never met each other and didn't have the same beliefs. So uh, this was a difficult process they were going through. And um, they got to the Continental Congress, realized that uh, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists had very different views. The Anti-Federalists, of course, believed that the uh, individual was not being protected of enough in this document, the Constitution. And they believed that the Bill of Rights was uh, not only um, necessary, but crucial to their vote. Uh, the Federalists believed that the original Articles of Confederation that they had been living under for some years since they had won their independence uh, made the federal government too weak. And most of the Anti-Federalists actually agreed with that. There was pretty good consensus that the um, Articles of Confederation needed to be replaced and updated. So there wasn't much debate there. The main debate was over the Bill of Rights and some other um, tweaking around the edges. So. The logjam actually was broken by James Madison in several ways. One, he proposed what was called the Virginia Plan, which uh, was a proposal that you would, they would create two houses in the legislature, one in the upper house or the Senate, and the other one, the lower house or the House of Representatives. House of Representatives would be representative of the people and the populations in each state. So the more populated states will get more representatives and the least populated states will get fewer representatives but that every state would be protected with the upper house uh, by having two senators, uh, no matter what their state population was. So that was uh, part of the Virginia Compromise of the Constitution and part of what uh, got it to be approved by that Continental Congress. The other compromise that was made uh, was around uh, James Madison making a personal promise that as soon as the Constitution would be ratified by all the states, he would introduce a Bill of Rights to address the anti-federalist concerns. And he did follow through on that promise in 1789 by introducing 12 bills of rights, uh, 10 of which got approved by the states. So uh, that was one thing out of that video I wanted to mention. Another thing I wanted to mention there is you saw um, the uh, states took a long time to ratify uh, and there was a lot of consternation by several of the big states, especially Virginia, Massachusetts, and New York. Uh, and so this was a lot of hand-wringing and a lot of haggling and negotiation that was going on between all the delegations of these states. So uh, really, the founders of the country and the Constitution really had no idea where this was going to go and if this new document was going to pass or if the Articles of Confederation were going to stay in place. So really interesting, delicate balance here between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, and uh, these founders were able to find that sweet spot between uh, federal power and states' rights. So let's go ahead and take a look at our second video. This is gonna be a reenactment. This is from the great show, John Adams on HBO. Uh, if you haven't seen this show, it's a really fantastic show. I highly recommend it. This is a scene where uh, Thomas Jefferson has just come back from France and he's come back from a France that is going through their own revolution, uh, very much inspired by the one that we had just completed in our country. And um, he's, having a debate with Alexander Hamilton. Of course, the two of them didn't agree on much. And as you'll find out in, later in this program, really were kind of at odds and at each other's throats uh, throughout the formation of our government. And uh, this gives you a really good summation of the type of debate they might've had almost on a daily basis. So let's take a look and then we'll talk about it. 
You must find Philadelphia much changed. There was more change than I could have imagined, Mr. Hamilton. Not the city itself. All cities swallow everything in their weight. That's no surprise to me. That's why I abhor them. But I've been, as you know, in revolutionary France, where the streets are filled with the songs of liberty and brotherhood and the overthrow of ancient tyrannies of Europe, and to return from there to this our cradle of revolution and find the dinner table chatter is all of money and banks and authority is an unwelcome surprise. Unwelcome, perhaps, but necessary. I must admit, Mr. Hamilton, I uh, a little uncertain as to the purpose of the Treasury Department. <laughs> no doubt its function will reveal itself to me in good time. The future of prosperity of this nation rests chiefly in trade. Trade depends, among other things, on the willingness of other nations to lend us money. And how would you propose to establish international credit? Our first step would be to incur a national debt. The greater the debt, the greater the credit. And to that end, I have recommended to the President that Congress adopt all the debts incurred by the individual states during the war through a national bank. The idea being that if the states owe Congress money, then other nations will feel more inclined to lend it to us. If the states are indebted to a central authority, it increases the power of the central government. You have it exactly. The greater the government's responsibility, the greater its authority. Mm. The moneyed interest in this country is all in the north, so the wealth and power would inevitably be concentrated there in the federal government, to the expense of the south. If that is the case, it is unavoidable if the union is to be preserved. I fear our revolution will have been in vain if a Virginia farmer is to be held in hock to a New York stock jobber, who in turn is in hock to a London banker. <laughs> the opportunities for uh, avarice and corruption would certainly prove irresistible. Well, there you have it, as I have heard said. If men were angels, then no government would be necessary. <laughs> well, sadly, that is very well said. Uh, but. There can be no question. Our nation cannot bind together without powerful central government. But we must also accommodate the needs of our constituent states, both North and South. Now, the power of one must check and balance the other. Uh, and to that end, we must dedicate all of our energies and our care. I would like to welcome Mr. Jefferson home. Mr. Secretary of State. Yeah, yeah. Mr. President, gentlemen. So you can really see there the tension between Jefferson and Hamilton over the table. They're sitting there at dinner uh, with Washington and his cabinet, uh, two of the most important cabinet members one of the Treasury and one of Secretary of State. Of course, Jefferson had been gone for a while, finally comes back from France, and he's being welcomed back, but gets immediately into an argument with Hamilton over uh, states' rights versus federalism. And uh, as you can see, Jefferson was not pleased with Hamilton, Hamilton's answers, although Hamilton was being sincere in his belief that a strong federal government, a strong central bank, the ability to borrow money on behalf of the country would lead to increased uh, economic capabilities, the ability to support a military, the ability to support a government, and build the ability to keep the country together is really what he was most interested in. Jefferson, of course, very suspicious because they've just fought a very bloody and costly war against England to get their uh, independence from a country that was very authoritarian. And you can imagine why the Anti-Federalists and really the South felt very much that uh, they were heading down the, wrong, the road to ruin again by going into this very strong central government, similar to what they had in London. Uh, as he also said there, you heard him talk about what I don't want to have happen as a farmer or a regular citizen being hot to the strong central bank, 
who's in hock to a London banker. And uh, that really was uh, very strongly the feeling of anti-federalists at the time. They were very suspicious of this. They didn't like it. And uh, they wanted to remain a uh, very kind of more weak uh, federal government with uh, strong state governments taking care of their citizens. So a really good reenactment there. You can also see um, Washington sitting there listening. Uh, that was actually true. He didn't say very much in his cabinet meetings. He would facilitate, he would run them, but he would mostly listen, nod, and uh, eventually make his decisions towards the end of the meetings. Uh, the most boisterous uh, individuals in those cabinet meetings, as you can imagine, were Jefferson and Hamilton. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but Hamilton loved debate. He thrived on it. Jefferson actually didn't like it very much, but he would engage in it uh, if he really felt strongly about the point that was being made. Uh, some of the other uh, gentlemen in that room there, you had Knox, who was the um, Secretary of War. And of course, you had John Adams sitting there uh, almost facilitating this debate and kind of sitting in the middle and trying to keep the peace among the folks that were in the uh, cabinet room at the time. John Adams, of course, was the vice president for Washington and uh, was a strong Federalist, but also felt very strongly that the protection for the southern states needed to be there for us to be able to keep this country together. So really interesting reenactment there. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look at our 25 interesting facts about this debate between Federalists and Anti-Federalists. All right, number one, Federalists versus Anti-Federalists, or Democratic Republicans, as Anti-Federalists were called at the time, was the key debate of our country's founding and is still the key debate between our current political parties 250 years later. And you can see uh, at that time there were a couple of symbols that were used. The Federalists used the symbol on the left and the Democratic Republicans the symbol on the right. And you would see that on a lot of their literature and a lot of their pamphlets and other political um, documents that were used. So let's talk about the difference between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Federalists wanted a strong central government and a weak state government at the state level. Uh, they, the key Federalists that are of note were Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, James Madison, George Washington, and of course, uh, as you saw there, John Adams was also added to that group. Um, their favorite document, of course, is the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and in terms of the Bill of Rights, uh, most of them would have given it a thumbs down, as you can see there. I believe the Constitution was sufficient to protect individual rights, and most of them believe that a uh, Bill of Rights was not necessary. Uh, the Anti-Federalists wanted power in the states and not in the central government. Some of the key Anti-Federalists were John Hancock, Patrick Henry, Richard Henry Lee, George Mason, and Mercy Otis Warren, and of course, Thomas Jefferson, the head of the Anti-Federalists. In terms of the document that they preferred, um, they kind of agreed that the Articles of Confederation was too weak, but they would have preferred to stay with that document if they had seen the Constitution as conscripted because it didn't have the uh, Bill of Rights in it. Uh, and in terms of the Bill of Rights, of course, they would have given it a thumbs up. They believe the Constitution was not sufficient to protect individual freedoms. Number two, Thomas Jefferson was a leading scholar and passionate advocate for limited federal government, with most power remaining with state governments, and he indicated so in all of his writings. Jefferson believed the federal government should be involved only in limited number of activities, such as national defense, diplomacy with other nations, and a national postal service. He was very passionate that the federal government was restrained by the Constitution in favor of individual rights. And along with the rest of the anti-federalist states' rights politicians, he believed the Bill of Rights was the most important part of our new governing documents. And uh, as you heard a little early in the program, of course, he wrote the um, basis for the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights uh, in his Virginia writings. Number three, Hamilton was one of the leading federalist voices for a strong central government to the detriment of states' rights and power. Alexander Hamilton was one of the leading advocates for the U.S. Constitution as written to be ratified without the Bill of Rights included. He believed in a strong central government with powers that came from a broad reading of the Constitution as opposed to states' rights and power. Hamilton made it his personal campaign to establish a central bank, arguing that it was necessary to be able to monitor the overall national economy, as well as create national debt to be able to borrow money to fund the government and the economy going forward. Number four, 
What was the political difference between rivals Jefferson and Hamilton? So the decade of the 1790s has been called the age of passion. Fervor ran high as rival factions battled over the course of the new republic. Each side convinced that the other's goals would betray the legacy of the revolution so recently fought and so dearly won. Jefferson, a true revolutionary, believed passionately in individual liberty and a more egalitarian society with a weak central government and greater powers for the states. Hamilton, a brilliant organizer and tactician, feared chaos and social disorder. He sought to build a powerful national government that would ensure the young nation's security and drive it towards economic greatness. Jefferson Hamilton is the story of the fierce struggle, both public and ultimately bitterly personal, between these two titans. It ended only with the death of Hamilton in a pistol duel felled by Aaron Burr, Jefferson's vice president. So how ironic is that, that one day Jefferson eventually became president and uh, his vice president, Aaron Burr, killed Hamilton in a duel. Number five, it's believed Alexander Hamilton authored most of the Federalist Papers. Apart from his stint as America's first Treasury Secretary, the Federalist Papers are the political achievement for which Hamilton is best known. They were published between 1787 and 1788. There were 85 essays that urged New York's electorate to ratify the recently proposed U.S. Constitution. The influential documents were written under the shared pseudonym Publius by Hamilton and James Madison and John Jay. Because none of them used their real names, we can't be certain about how many papers each man wrote, but the general consensus credits Hamilton with 51 of those papers with Madison with 29 and Jay with five. You see a good quote there from Hamilton. We are now forming a Republican government. Real liberty is neither found in despotism or the extremes of democracy, but in moderate governments. So that's really what all of these men were trying to find. What is that perfect balance between power that is required, but also individual liberties? Six, how was Jefferson Hamilton's personal relationship? So before George Washington appointed them to his cabinet, Hamilton as Treasury Secretary, Jefferson as Secretary of State, they barely even knew each other. Initially, the two men enjoyed a cordial relationship. Jefferson invited Hamilton to dinner on a number of occasions, and they seldom clashed during their first year in the administration. But they were never close. A dozen years apart in age, Jefferson was 47 at the time, Hamilton 35 in 1790. They could not have been more different in temperament. Hamilton was outgoing and outspoken. He dominated every room he was in. Jefferson was amiable and quiet and reserved and did his talking through his pen. Deep philosophical differences, though, soon set them against each other. In Jefferson's view, centralized government was simply European-style tyranny waiting to happen again. Hamilton believed that a flourishing merchant economy would sow opportunities for all. Further, it would produce a philanthropic and knowledgeable and enterprising people. A clash between the two founding fathers was inevitable. The personal animus grew as it did between Federalists and Anti-Federalists from 1780 to 1800, which was the worst period of political clashing between these points of view. In the end, Jefferson resigned as Secretary of State in the Washington administration due to his deep differences with Hamilton and the Federalist vision of the future of the country. So pretty amazing that uh, these guys got along great the first year, but then after that really were at each other's throats and really head to head in terms of all the debates. And eventually Jefferson decided to resign and go home and retire to his home. Number seven, amazingly, Hamilton helped his arch rival Jefferson win the presidency in 1800. So some years later, after Jefferson had retired back to Monticello, he did decide to run in 1800, and the 1800 election was deadlocked between Burr and Jefferson and went to the Congress to decide the outcome after Adams was defeated. Hamilton favored his arch rival Jefferson over Burr, and he convinced several Federalists to switch their support to Jefferson, giving Jefferson a victory on the 36th ballot. Never stayed up three days until a decision. Jefferson became the second consecutive incumbent vice president to be elected president. So pretty incredible if you think about this uh, election that happened. It was that close. It got to a 36th ballot in Congress and really took Hamilton uh, pushing his Federalist brethren over to help who was his major arch rival to win the presidency. 
Number eight, Hamilton's time as tax collector shaped his Federalist leanings. After his war service ended, he worked as a tax collector for the new federal government and saw that many New Yorkers didn't want to pay taxes to the federal government. They wanted to keep money in their own state. But the war wasn't over yet, and once it ended, the new nation would have to pay back the money it borrowed from other countries to fund it. Hamilton knew this would be a problem. Some states were not paying their fair share. In 1787, he attended the Constitutional Convention. He would work with other delegates to write the U.S. Constitution. That would give more power to the federal government. Many delegates didn't like it, so Hamilton and two other leaders wrote 85 essays, the Federalist Papers, as we just explained. They convinced delegates to sign the new Constitution and go back to their states to get it ratified. It's a pretty interesting. He uh, spent some time as a tax collector, and it really helped shape the need for this greater federal government, the ability to, for taxation. Number nine, Patrick Henry was an early advocate of the Bill of Rights and an anti-federalist. The orator who gave us the famous give me liberty or give me death speech was an early advocate of the Bill of Rights to be included in the U.S. Constitution. When the Constitution was sent to Virginia for ratification in 1788, Henry wanted a Bill of Rights to be included, similar to the one that was in the Virginia Constitution, as written by Jefferson and Madison. But most delegates, including James Madison, didn't think one would be necessary in the federal document. Henry thought its absence signaled a federal power grab and that the U.S. Constitution was incomplete without it. He argued vehemently day after day in the ratifying convention for its inclusion and swore he would never vote for it without the Bill of Rights. Madison, struggling to convince Virginia's anti-federalist delegates to ratify the Constitution, arranged for a Bill of Rights to be added once the Constitution was approved. The first U.S. Congress drew up a list of 12 rights and sent them to the states for ratification, but this wasn't good enough for Henry. The states ended up approving 10 of the rights, which were amended to the Constitution in 1791. And you see a picture of uh, Patrick Henry there on the top left and also the uh, U.S. Constitution on the bottom left. So he was the first real anti-federalist that came out completely against the Constitution without a Bill of Rights. Number 10, James Madison won an oratory duel with Patrick Henry over the U.S. Constitution and the Ratification Convention in Virginia. So we just mentioned Patrick Henry's vehemently arguing against the Constitution. Well, his opponent in that uh, particular body in Virginia was James Madison. Of course, James Madison had been a big proponent and one of the writers of the U.S. Constitution itself. Throughout their home state of Virginia, Patrick Henry, the Anti-Federalist, was renowned as a public speaking heavyweight who wooed crowds wherever he went. Thomas Jefferson declared that the booming debater spoke as Homer wrote. Madison, the Federalist, in contrast, had quiet voice and little talent for theatrics. In 1788, a ratifying convention was held in Richmond to determine if Virginia would grant her approval to the Constitution Madison had helped engineer. Henry staunchly opposed this document and loudly decried it for leaning towards monarchy. Madison offered concise, well-articulated rebuttals to every argument, and Virginia's representative voted 89 to 79 in favor of ratification. So essentially, Henry was an amazing speaker, but Madison won this oratory battle. Number 11, George Mason's low profile in history, partly due to his no vote on the Constitution. First, his refusal to sign the Constitution and participate in the new federal government put him on the loser's side of history. Despite having very good reasons for his opposition, as did many anti-federalist contemporaries having similar issues with the Constitution, this seemed to taint Mason's legacy for future historians. Secondly, he didn't want the fame. While it was inappropriate in this time to appear desirous of power and notoriety, many still sought such positions time and again. Mason, however, had a true desire for the happiness of independency and the blessings of the private station over the troubles and vexations of public service. But despite being sidelined in most history books, he still led a fascinating life and contributed much to our American identity. Mason was in the same camp as Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson and John Hancock with, in wanting limited federal government with most powers left to the state's governments, which were closest to the people. Number 12, John Jay co-authored five of the Federalist Papers with Alexander Hamilton and James Madison. We mentioned the three men that uh, wrote those papers. Well, John Jay wrote five of them. 
published between 1787 and 88. Five of the 85 were written by John Jay. Because none of them were had used their real names, we still aren't certain how many he wrote, but that was the estimate that there was five. John Jay was a Federalist and had a strong proponent for a strong centralized federal government with broad powers to govern. And he wrote several papers, both in the Federalist Papers and also wrote articles under his own name in Boston Papers at the time, talking about the reasons why uh, a very strong central government was necessary. Number 13, George Washington, as the father of our country, had very strong voice behind the Federalist cause which was actually interesting if you think about it. George Washington was from Virginia, and you would think that he would have come out on the anti-federalist side, but he did not. Although Washington made few direct contributions to the text of the new constitution, and he never officially joined the Federalist Party, he profoundly supported the philosophy behind the constitution and was an ardent supporter of its ratification. Washington was skeptical of constitutional opponents known as anti-federalists, believing that they were either misguided or seeking personal gain. He believed strongly in the goals of the Constitution and saw the Federalist Papers and similar publications as crucial to the process of bolstering support for its ratification. Washington describes such publications as have thrown new lights upon the science of government. They have given the rights of man a full and fair discussion and have explained them in so clear and forcible a manner as cannot fail to make a lasting impression upon those who read the best publications of the subject, and particularly the pieces under the signature of Publius. So he really gave his support to the Constitution, gave his support to the Federalist Papers, and to the whole thought about our new government being a stronger centralized force. Number 14, John Hancock was the original founder and revolutionary, but did not believe in a strong centralized government and joined the Anti-Federalists. Hancock was a wealthy merchant and patriot and governor of Massachusetts and an anti-federalist. John Hancock was an able president of the Continental Congress and worked vigorously to shore up the continental finances and supply for the military. Hancock also famously presided over the ratification of the Declaration of Independence in July 1776. The first copy was sent to the printer on 4th of July and Hancock, as president of the Congress, was the only name to appear on the document at first. So you can imagine, you can see the picture up on the top left there with John Hancock's very famous signature. Uh, that was the only one that was on the page when it was sent over, and then the other ones were added later. He was a firm advocate of state authority. He questioned the need for a stronger central government and feared tyranny would be the result of political centralization. So he was very much an anti-federalist, one of the few that actually came from the North. Most of the anti-federalists were Southerners. Number 15, Benjamin Franklin came out of retirement into public service and was a Federalist. By 1748, the 42-year-old was rich enough to hang up his printer's apron and became a gentleman of leisure. Franklin's retirement allowed him to spend his remaining 42 years studying science and devising inventions such as the lightning rod, bifocal glasses, and more efficient heating stove. It also gave him the freedom to devote himself to public service. He served as a delegate to the Continental Congress and the Constitutional Convention. He was a diplomat and ambassador to France and Sweden. He was the first postmaster general and president of the Supreme Executive Council of Pennsylvania. Franklin was reluctant to break away from England, but when he jumped on board, he believed that a stronger central government would be the key to holding the new nation together. He was a passionate advocate for the new US Constitution and its ratification by all 13 state colonies. You see a couple of pictures there of him reading the Constitution and then also arguing on its behalf. Number 16, Jefferson favored giving power to the people. Anti-Federalists such as Thomas Jefferson feared that a concentration of central authority might lead to a loss of individual and states' rights. They resented Federalist monetary policies, which they believed gave advantages to the upper class at the disadvantage of the average citizen. Jefferson also believed the bigger federal government the smaller our individual rights and that it was a direct correlation. So that's uh, something that we still argue with today about if you have a larger federal government, do you have fewer individual rights? And that was something he was talking about back then. His writings through the time of our country's formation were very clear that the country needed to continue to keep power spread out and not concentrated in a very few. In foreign policy, Federalists generally favored England over France 
whereas the anti-federalist Republicans leaned towards France, which had supported the American cause during the American Revolution. And that certainly was true here. John Adams, of course, was a federalist and was very much uh, pro-England in terms of his uh, bent towards diplomacy. And Thomas Jefferson was a Francophone. He was very uh, pro pro France in all of our international dealings. Number 17, Hamilton was driven by trade and commerce, as he wrote in Federalist Number 11. Federalist Papers Number 11 addresses the necessity of a unified regulation of trade among states under the federal government. At the time, Congress did not have the power to regulate the commerce and trade between states or foreign countries. Also, because of the status quo, foreign countries would not agree with individual unnecessary trade agreements with states. Alexander Hamilton saw the necessity of a common regulation to prevent future consequences the country may face when engaging in commerce. This idea is then later put into effect by stating, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among several states and with Indian tribes in the Constitution, which is also known now as the Commerce Clause. So it's a very important uh, aspect that was part of the Constitution that was added to give the um, federal government the ability to regulate commerce and to make deals with international countries. Number 18, George Washington wanted the first administration to have many differences of opinion and viewpoints. And you can see a couple pictures there of his cabinet, the top up there with the, his four cabinet members sitting with him. And then you see his first cabinets down here at the bottom. You had Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of the Treasury, Jefferson, Secretary of State, Henry Knox, Secretary of War, and of course, John Adams, the Vice President. Differences of opinion didn't concern President Washington. They could even be useful until he came to realize in 1792 the very personal nature of the differences between two of his cabinet members, Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. President Washington could also be very skilled in dealing with his cabinet, managing them in almost the same way he had consulted with his staff of generals during the revolution. He solicited each person's opinion, opposed as they may be, considered his options, and then made a decision. When he selected Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton for his cabinet, he didn't know that they would become enemies. At first, they got along fine. Hamilton occasionally asked for Jefferson's opinions, and Jefferson nominated Hamilton for membership in the American Philosophical Society. It wasn't until Hamilton's economic policies began to take shape in late 1791 and 1792 that each man took a closer look at the other and didn't like what they saw. This is one area in which George Washington created some of his own trouble. Eager to convince Jefferson and Hamilton to accept their offices, Washington was a bit too expansive in his descriptions of both jobs. In essence, he led both men to assume that their position was the most important position in the cabinet. So Washington kind of brought a little bit of this on himself, this rivalry, because he was essentially saying one or the other was important. Number 19, Hamilton proposed the first National Bank of the United States. Hamilton proposed the first National Bank to facilitate trade and commerce and to be able to take on and manage a national debt on behalf of the new nation. Jefferson fiercely opposed this bill by lobbying Congress to vote against it. Hamilton won the battle and the Central Bank was born, but with a limited charter. The first bank of the United States was chartered for a term of 20 years by the United States Congress on February 25, 1791. This national bank was established to stabilize the currency, manage national debt, and facilitate economic growth in the United States. It opened for business in Philadelphia on December 12, 1791, with branches subsequently opening in cities such as Boston, New York, Charleston, and Baltimore. The bank played a role in early financial development of the United States, establishing a national economic system across state lines and a unified approach to negotiating with foreign nations. You see a picture there on the bottom left of what that national bank looked like back in 1791 in a uh, artist rendering. And then that's the building today on the bottom right. Uh, what it still looks like is being preserved. And you can see the uh, stone has become very yellow over time. So that's, uh, that's where all the power was, uh, was based in terms of the Treasury Department. Number 20, Federalists and Republicans disagreed over how long a president should serve. The Constitutional Convention was at a pause to try to figure out what to do with the executive branch and how long a president should serve. Should it be for life or should it be for several terms? 
Madison put forth a proposal to try to unblock the disagreement. And as you can see, we talked about this earlier, Madison was always kind of the peacemaker. He was always coming up with compromises. He essentially said that a president could serve for two terms, either consecutive or not consecutive. Hamilton was on the side of president for life, as long as that officer wanted to serve. Jefferson was on the side of limited number of terms, either two or three. So they ended up settling, of course, on the two terms. Number 21, Federalists wanted a Northern capital and Anti-Federalists Republicans wanted a capital in Virginia. Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and the Virginia contingent argued strongly that Virginia was the natural place for a capital, ideally Richmond, since it was directly in the center of the East Coast and was the place that most of the founding fathers had come from. Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, and other Federalists wanted to maintain the capital of Philadelphia and the industrial North. The compromise was to place the new capital on the Potomac River in between Virginia and Maryland. And as you can see, top left, you see the uh, what Philadelphia used to look like in the 1790s. And then in the center was the uh, Capitol building in Washington, D.C., the first Capitol building. And then on the right, of course, was the original White House before it got burned down in 1812. Number 22, Jefferson and Hamilton wrote personal letters to Washington throughout their dispute in the cabinet. Throughout their time in Washington's first cabinet, Jefferson and Hamilton wrote numerous letters to Washington disparaging their rival and discussing why their view of strong central government or states' rights was wrong and should not be pursued for the good of the new country. Washington never was persuaded one way or the other and would acknowledge the letters and make his own decisions. So he basically acknowledged these letters. He told them that he had read them. He took them under advisement. Uh, he appreciated them writing him, but he would always be his own man and always make his own decisions. Really interesting, though, that they had these voracious debates on a daily basis and uh, would go back and forth in front of Washington, but also felt the need when they were at private time to write individual letters privately to Washington to try to convince him. 23, the first cabinet in 1793 and 1793 were meeting sometimes five times a week to discuss the direction of the country. You can see a picture there in Washington's very small office in the presidential uh, residence up in Philadelphia. Washington's first cabinet often meet every day during the week, three to four hours a day in Philadelphia with no air conditioning in the summer. Do you imagine how uncomfortable these men were crowded into Washington's office with no air conditioning for three to four hours a day? These meetings will get very uncomfortable Sometimes it would meet in the President Washington's study in the executive residence, which was only 21 feet by 15 feet, relatively small space. So these men were right on top of each other every single day. The meetings were uncomfortable in other ways as well, because they were having to create and craft a new nation with no rules of the road. And often it broke into arguments over how large the federal government should be and how powerful versus how to balance it against individual liberties of the citizens. With Jefferson and Hamilton usually leading the way on debates, with John Adams sometimes weighing in and Washington mostly listening intently. So you can just imagine day after day after day of these debates, what it must have been like as they were crafting the new nation. 24, Hamilton loved debate and Jefferson would engage but did not enjoy it. In 1793, the cabinet meetings were often called cockfights because they got so heated. Hamilton would go on and on with his important point, sometimes speaking for 45 minutes to an hour uninterrupted, peering into all angles of his argument. Jefferson would listen and wait patiently, but had become a very good debater himself over the years, and he would be more succinct and to the point and would often cut Hamilton's arguments to the core with witty points that Hamilton had a difficult time rebutting. Washington would sometimes call a timeout between these two cabinet members and recommend that they go downstairs and have some dinner over wine. The British had a room in their parliament that was very similar at the time. It was called the cockpit, where they dressed down Benjamin Franklin one time in a humiliating fashion. You can imagine that did not feel very good for Franklin, who was standing there as our representative and had to be dressed down by the, the British in the cockpit. So possibly because they spent too much time together in the cabinet, Jefferson and Hamilton started to really hate each other and found each other as a mortal threat to the nation and its future prospects. You can see a picture there in top right of Hamilton and Jefferson having a debate and 
Adam's actually listening on. Here's some great quotes uh, about this debate between Federalists and Anti-Federalist ideology. Let's go through these here. First one is constitutions should consist only of general provisions. The reason is that they must necessarily be permanent and that they cannot calculate for the possible change of things. So Hamilton there was arguing that the constitution as written was great, but it also needed to be flexible and needed to be amended in the future because we, we couldn't consider every possibility. So another one here, an elective despotism was not the government we fought for but one in which the powers of government should be so divided and balanced among the several bodies of magistrate that no one could transcend their legal limits without being effectively checked and restrained by the others. So James Madison was talking about how important checks and balances is, and he really was the biggest advocate of all of them for checks and balances. He found many different ways in his writings in the Constitution to find ways to check each other's power from state level to federal level. Next one up here in the top right, the end of democracy and the defeat of the American Revolution will occur when government falls into the hands of lending institutions and moneyed incorporations. That was Thomas Jefferson many years later talking about he still had not gotten over the idea of the central bank and the idea of all the power being centralized into just a, a very few wealthy people and wealthy banks. He really always, until his death, was completely against that and felt like that was the, the anti-democracy of money. Next one here, no legislative act contrary to the Constitution can be valid. That was another Alexander Hamilton quote. Jefferson said, I prefer dangerous freedom over peaceful slavery. So that really was kind of summing up the way these revolutionaries really felt. The uh, Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death kind of thought. Another uh, quote down here in the bottom left, a little rebellion now and then is a good thing. Here's one by James Madison. Liberty may be endangered by the abuses of liberty as well as the abuses of power. James Madison. And you can see he wrote that in the Federalist Papers and he really uh, was trying to say that essentially we needed to find balance in everything that we put into our government. You can't have too much liberty and you can't have too much power. You need to find that perfect balance in between. Final quote here by Benjamin Franklin, freedom is not a gift bestowed upon us by other men, but a right that belongs to us by the laws of God and nature. And they really summed up the way a lot of these men really did feel. They felt like the documents that were founding our government needed to reflect this concept that it was God and providence that gave them the ability to rule this nation. So I hope you enjoyed that. A lot of really interesting uh, items there that I had dug up in my research to come up with those 25 interesting facts about this debate between Federalists and Anti-Federalists. And uh, as you can see, it's an incredible debate that had been going on really since 1780 all the way through the Jefferson administration and has continued even today. Uh, there's elements of everything that they were talking about back then that we're still wrestling with today. What is the perfect balance between individual freedoms protected by the Bill of Rights and um, federal power uh, that's enumerated in the Constitution. And then secondly, um, the states, how, what are their role going forward? What is their role in their governments? Should they in some ways be more powerful? Should they be holding um, authority over more things in our lives since they're closer to our lives? Or should it be the federal government that has its tentacles and everything? So that's really uh, very much the debate that we have even in our elections today. Uh, but you can see Jefferson and Hamilton were two of the real titans of our founding. Uh, they were amazing debaters, amazing writers. They had the ear of our father of our country, George Washington. They had the ear of our citizens. And uh, this debate, as you saw, started then and continues today. And hopefully we as a country will continue to find that perfect balance in all of our founding documents and how we go forward. Hope you enjoyed that and um, thank you very much for your attention today. Please like this video and subscribe to the channel. We have a lot of great programs coming your way and we really appreciate your attention today and uh, hope you have a great evening.